Welcome to MLR Kickoff. Um, as you can probably tell, I am not Dan Power. It is Pete Steinberg. Dan is off having multiple dinners and multiple lunches um, for his job. So I am being, I am joined by Stats Boy, now the most important person leading into the playoff competition for Major League Rugby, Aaron Castro. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, Pete, and Ginty for, you know, trying to figure out how all of our schedules would work. You know, the last time we did this, I got yelled at. <laughs> so I'm probably expecting to get yelled at on Friday. Uh, the traveling globe trotters that you are and your schedules it, being what they be. And there's a hey, storm here in Dallas. Hey, okay, so there's a storm in Dallas. I am home. Admittedly, I got home about an hour ago. So I was gone for about 10 days. So I got home about an hour ago. Um, but but happy happy that you can make it. Happy that you can join us. Yeah. And we'll just, like I, like, I think the last time we did this, Aaron, you had Dan as your host. And, and of course, the problem with Dan as your host is he'll be controversial. And he'll ask you questions that put you in the spot. I, being the nice member of the Major League Rugby kickoff duo, will not. So we'll just have softballs the whole time. And you know oh. me, I just want to talk rugby. There'll be, oh, there'll awesome. be no, no, like, lead. Yeah, no lead gossip. So you don't want to talk no, about um, the rugby tour to New Orleans and someone losing all of their stuff that wasn't me. So we're going to leave that one uh, on the side. Uh, so, but so, I would just like to point out that, that George Killebrew, I asked no questions about that. So this is Aaron <laughs> literally digging his own hole. Talking about uh, I, I did Orleans, get so I to go it. to New Orleans this last weekend. I got we got hosted by the NOLA Gold, and we gotta say they know how to throw on a tremendous rugby event for the fans, and also yep. for nerds like me. I saw inside the beautiful mind of Ryan Fitzgerald's office, and he's tracking like five hundred uh, senior rugby players that are graduating this year and getting ready for the draft his whiteboard was great and their facility um the gold mine is truly amazing i i gotta say like they've got it's you know it's one of the top facilities in major league rugby um and how they recognize players they have a jacket club they have um cap numbers for every single player that they use for for the gold so um what they're doing down in new orleans is uh, is top end for for major league rugby and what uh, i would say a model for what we want to do in this league so that's i think yeah, when I it mean, comes out yeah oh sorry aaron i think i think we have some connectivity issues we'll, we will deal with this i think i think the gold mine from the last time I was there, um, has I know they've had some huge upgrades. I haven't been there for a couple of years, but when they first had it, they had some big plans. And you're right. Um, I think Ryan really runs a good ship down there, and, and they're running that the right way. I know it's been a disappointing season for them, but um, you know I feel like that they have a, a plan, a plan for a plan. Um, so, so you are someone that watches every major league rugby game every weekend. Um, I, I admit that that I, I, I try to, but more often than not, don't make it. What was your, what, what was the, the most interesting game you watched this past weekend, Aaron? Um, I, I guess there were two really is game one, which is New England uh, traveling to Toronto. And they had a bunch of changes towards the end. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, people are getting the flu or something. Like there are just, it's just not, and I'm not yeah. like, these guys are not like, If well, I know we're talking, like we had a lot of COVID protocols and everything last season. Well, we still have COVID protocols in place for this season and guys are like going through the testing protocols once they're symptomatic and, and none of, <laughs> we're having very few COVID positives and none of these drops are, or, or for for COVID, they're for guys that are just feeling unwell, and I'm pretty sure the flu is going around. Yep. And you know, they had a bunch of changes uh, going into that one. New York had a bunch of changes, and even then, with the changes for for both teams, I I was surprised at both results, and more so with with how Toronto played because they have not even in the oh, wins no. that they have yeah. had, they have not played well. And they went out and they punched the 
you know, the league leading team straight up in the mouth a couple times and broke the longest win streak in major league rugby. So I think just looking at that piece is very important. Um, there, there were a few changes for New York and this one is where I wouldn't say we've seen Ryan Reese's coming out party, but we've seen him for the first time be an attacking player uh, and, and still be a huge distributor and guide the rugby ATL attack, which is not really how they've used their nines in the past. Mostly it's like fast distribution and run things through their 10. Uh, Kirk Coleman was basically a straight distributor um, in this game for, for rugby ATL. And then you had obviously a red card for, for Will Tucker um, and then a yellow card for, I think it was Brendan O'Connor. I'm not sure. Don't, don't quote me on that, on that one, but they also had a yellow card. So they sort of didn't do themselves any favors, but uh, in a sense, New York just didn't have it on, on Sunday. And even with the changes, I thought they would have done a lot more. Um, but RB ATL came out to play and, you know, plant their flag back in the playoff hunt to at least get the second seed in the East. Yeah, I mean, I think whenever Andy Ellis doesn't play for New York, that always has a concern for me, right? I mean, that's the guy, and especially if he doesn't play nine, um, because I know he's played he played 10 earlier on in the season. And I think you saw that a little bit. Um, I, I agree with you about Ryan Reese. I think ATL... They've been a little bit more inconsistent. I think what was, I mean, in that red card, they scored two tries. They were up, I think, 19-3, and the game was kind of over. Um, I think that's interesting. But I, I, I want to go back to your first comment because the game that was most interesting to me was the Tor- Toronto Arrows over New England. And I think what's, what's, what was really interesting about this, like you said, is Toronto actually played really, really well. Um, and they put so much pressure and so... What, what really worked, what was so interesting for me was how Toronto really contested at the breakdown. They, they won that point of contact. That slowed down the attack for, um, uh, for New England. And then that led to pressure. And that led to 16 handling errors. I'll say that again. 16 handling errors for New England, which is like ridiculous. I mean, that's just and, – and that – but you say, well, you know, you got to work on your hands when actually – it's really about the breakdown. And of course, the guy that we really look at for that is Lucas Rumble. And I'm just going to pull up some ridiculous stats for him. So he had, um, so he entered 13 um, defensive rucks and he was the first person defending 12 of them. And there isn't a single player um, on the, um, I think, uh, is it, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, there isn't a single player that is above five. Andrew Quatrin has five. Um, you know, so this guy has more than double of, of anyone else's entries and it just makes it so difficult. You have to, you actually have to play him. So what you have to do is you have to find ways to put Lucas Rumble on the ground so he can't be at the breakdown because if you don't do that, he slows the ball down and then it becomes just an absolute, just a really, really difficult, it's, it's just so difficult for teams to be able to um, get into their continuity. And you saw that this New England team that has looked so good just really, really struggle. I mean, this was well played. Like both teams did one in line outs, both teams did one in scrums. The penalty count was low, but it's that it's that handling error, that inability for um, New England to get into their attacking patterns that was really the key giveaway for that game. Yeah, this this game for Rumble was like it, it really brought you a lot back to the stuff he did last season, where he just had this huge season of putting you know Toronto on his back. And just willing them to to games to get over the line when when they did win games and you know that it was just a struggle of a season and he's been a bit banged up this season which you know when you're reliant on guys like him and Mike Shepard to be very high work rate players when they're banged up and still playing it it reduces the work rate quite a lot and then you know when you lose a guy for most of the season like Tomas de la Vega you know who's a huge ball carrier for them it it really stunts a a lot of stuff I, I would say they've been really injured most of the season and you know, I would say they're still very in, injured most of the season, but they they came out and they did something and showed that 
they can still get into the playoffs. Uh, now, some things have to go their way. They have to win these next two games. And Atlanta can't – I think it's can't win this weekend. Um, or can't – no. Yeah, can't win this – is it this weekend? Do they play Atlanta hey, this hey, week? Hey, hold that. Hold that. Hold we'll that. We'll get to Let's let's, let's let's read yeah, my own rundown. We're gonna that. But yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna go through. And so, actually, what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, move into uh, an interview that I had with um, Benji Bonasso, who is uh, one of the South Americans that came north for Major League Rugby, plays for Rugby New York. And let's hear a little bit from Benji. Welcome, Benji Bonasso, to um, Major League Rugby kickoff. Hi Pete, how are you? Really nice to be here. How are you? Um, I am doing very well. I am doing very well. Thank you so much for joining us. Especially, I, I know it's late, so um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're sticking with the um, Argentinian tradition of eating at 11 p.m. So you still have some time before you go eat. Uh, but we'll get on to a little bit about Argentina and things that you miss and and, and you don't miss. Obviously, you're, you've been a star for um, the New York side in Major League Rugby, but can you talk about what brought you to New York for Major League Rugby and what that journey was like? Yeah, so everything starts when COVID hits in Argentina. I receive a text message from my friend Matias Freire that is now playing in San Diego. And he texts me, hey, in Houston, they are looking for a forward with a passport, American passport. Um, and I was I was keen to, to join uh, MLR team, so I start making my own video, and I sent my video to Houston, but I wasn't lucky uh, to get picked, and I start sending my video to other teams, and at that moment, Red Mac Williams was uh, here, the coach, and contacted me, and he was, hey, Benji, we want you here, um, and I was really happy to to hear about that because i was born here uh, in the state of connecticut right really close to new york so it was a, an amazing experience to come back and i think join this team now argentina has its own culture and brand of rugby what were some of the things that were different when you came and played in the u.s no, I think the, the most thing, the, the, the different thing about Argentina here is maybe the, the passion. Uh, but also you find the passion because that's the crazy thing of the, this league. You can share the culture of maybe we have, I think here, like eight different countries. Uh, so you get to know different people, different values. And that's the, the greatest thing I, I ever, like, I have been... Um, learning about the other guys and that's it's really good uh, but yeah the rugby is this I don't know it's the same um, yeah it's pretty the same now you came over last year and it's, it always takes a little bit of a transition um, but by the end of last season you were really flying and playing really well can you talk about personally what it took I mean first of all when you landed in New York it was probably a little cold <laughs> maybe a little colder than, you, than yeah. you're used to. So, so um, and, and, and New York's kind of hard to get around. So can you just talk a little bit about what it was yeah. like, like maybe your first week with the New York team? Yeah, so last season uh, at the beginning was really tough. I was really lucky. I was with my girlfriend and Joel Miranda, that was also a guy from Argentina. Uh, so that make it, it made it really easy because I felt like it was with uh, people that I know and was, really easy. And then when I get to training at the, at the beginning, I don't know anyone. Uh, it was tough to, you know, people were like, oh, this guy's from South America. We don't know him. We don't know how he plays. Uh, but when I start training and in practice, uh, having some scrimmages and everything, I start to nothing to show how I play and maybe get some respect, you know? And, yep. but at the beginning, yeah, it was really tough. The weather, a new city, new new experience because it was my first time as professional player. Uh, but then with the with the weeks, I start to get the confident, you know, and I start enjoying. I always said that we are the the luckiest guys to to work. We are we have a, we have a privilege to work uh, playing rugby, no? Absolutely. So 
was being a professional rugby player something that you aspired to when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah. So I, since I was a kid, I always loved sports. I started playing soccer when I was a kid. Uh, I make a lot of athleticism in school. Uh, and then when I get to know rugby, I, I enjoy it a lot. My family is a rugby family. Um, and then, yeah, I started doing it because of friends. And I started playing well. And yeah, and now I'm here. So yeah, I enjoy it a lot. <laughs> now, um, you know, it's, when you came over, it was sort of assumed that you might play a little bit of lock and a little bit of flanker, but it seems like you're just playing flanker. Is that kind of like the spot that you really see yourself? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, I can play both, but I'm more, more as a, a flanker, a six. Uh, I can play more in the edge than a tough lock, you know. I'm not a heavy as a lock. Um, this weekend I play as a lock because we have some right. injuries, red card, and I finish play as, as a lock. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm more, I'm, I enjoy more playing flanker or number eight, whatever. Well, and, and you've had a lot of really good forwards with the New York team. Can you talk about which of the forwards have had the biggest impact on you as a player? Yeah, so this year, so last season we have a lot of players, but I learned about, a lot about uh, uh, Butcher, um, Juan uh, Leguisa, Leguisamon, he was last season here, um, Nate, Nick Civetta, uh, and this year we have a legend that is Brendan O'Connor. He's a great guy, a great player, and a great person. Uh, also, Cala Pryor. Uh, I don't know, all of them are really, really good, and they teach me every week, and I learn from them, and that's amazing. Um, so, yeah, I'm really happy to, to have uh, teammates like that because you learn every day, no? <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about this season. I mean, um, you're, you're, I think, maybe not quite guaranteed a playoff spot, but it's pretty close. Um, <clears throat> you know, a disappointing loss, obviously, this past weekend. Talk about um, going into the last two weeks of the season, what you guys are focused on. Um, and, you know, I think your last game is against uh, the Free Jacks, right? And there might be something to play. Um, so talk a little, maybe talk a little bit about how the team has gone this season yeah. and um, what it's going to look like for the last couple of games. So yeah, the team this year, I think if you go player by player, they are, all of them are amazing. We have all blacks. Uh, so the team is really confident. I think now we're foc focusing, uh, the focus is now on us. It depends on us. If we want to make it, we're going to make it. And so yeah, every week is different. We we train. Uh, fo the focus again is on us. So tomorrow we have mini groups. We say what we do wrong in the game. What can what are we doing better? And um, yeah, so training for the next match that is going to be a glory. Um, and we're gonna yeah we're going game by game, you know, um, and try to do our best because we we, we know we can do it. Uh, and it's gonna be tough. This weekend was tough. We have a lot of challenges. Some guys were sick, injured, and we, we went there in the hot weather and tried to make it work. Yeah, I, I mean, have you played in conditions ever that were that hot? Uh, uh, maybe last season, uh, when we played the semi-final against Atlanta, it was humid, really, really humid. But yeah, I don't know if it was as hot as this weekend. Uh, it was really tough, and yeah, a lot of the guys were coming from from the flu, so it was really tough. So talk about your game and your development. I mean, you're a U.S. qualified player. Um, you're in, you know in, you're you're in the back row, which is an area of real strength for the U.S. Eagles. Have you had any conversations with Gary Gold about where you sit? So at the moment, so I was, I played my first game with the Eagles last summer against Uruguay. Um, and now I'm in the big group, uh, but they're going to give the list maybe some in some weeks. Uh, we have a camp three weeks ago in Houston. It was really good. And we're preparing ourselves to, to beat Chile. 
Uh, so I'm ready. I'm trying to get better every week and, and be ready to, to join that team or help uh, in, the, in, the tr in the training or whatever they need me, no? Uh, but yeah, it's an, it's an honor to, to represent a country and, and also trying to make the, wor the World Cup will be awesome. And so when you look at your journey potentially to the World Cup in 2023 and you look at your game, where do you think you need to improve to push your way in to consistently be in that back row for the Eagles? Oof, tough question. Uh, maybe when, when you play international, I think it, the, the guys are huge, strong, you know, uh, and we always talk about that, maybe getting more weight or, yeah, right. I think that's the most important thing. And then, yeah, trying to Improving every day, my, my, my skills, defense, attack, and, and everything will help to be in, in the best way I can. Now, you know, you always get selected for what you can do, right? Not for what you can't do. So what, do you, what would you say your two biggest strengths are as a player? Oof. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I have skills with the ball, uh, ball in hand. Um, I, have, I have a passion passion for, for every action I, I make. So I think that's my, we, we talk about the, always the X, X factor. Uh, right. but, uh, so it's the intensity that you bring. Yeah. That's true. Right. Yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, you're from Argentina, you're now living in New York. Um, what are some of the things that you miss about Argentina? Yeah. Uh, so at uh, this moment, this season so far, it's, it's been a really difficult year for me because I came here alone without my girlfriend and any teammate is from South America, uh, so from Argentina. So it's really tough. I miss like showing maybe the culture, uh, drinking some mate with uh, some Argentinian guys or speaking in Spanish. Although I, I drink mate with some Windsor, so that's great. Um, <laughs> I, I miss more of that, like, you know, the culture, eating a barbecue or having, speaking in Spanish. Uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a good also. Well, I think um, Brian Ginty, our producer, said that there's an Argentinian store in Brooklyn and there has to be a strong Argentinian um, <clears throat> uh, group in New York. Like it's a, it's a very cosmopolitan, so it's just finding yeah. where they are and then you'll be able to drink as much mate you'll, you'll be able to have your midnight asada i mean i was in the, i've been to buenos aires once and i had an asada at midnight and i didn't eat anything for like another 36 hours because i had so much meat in me i don't think i was hungry again yeah so, so i'm gonna i'm gonna find that place in google maps and maybe go there you go yeah. there you yeah. go well um Benji, thank you so much for your time today. Um, good luck in the run-in. It's going to be really close with you in Atlanta fighting for that home semi-final. And we look forward to you, I'm sure, wearing the colors of the US Eagles in the future. Thank you very much, Pete. It's, it's been an honor to be here. Um, we're going to work hard to, to get to the, to the finals. So thank you. So interesting to hear about his different experience, Aaron, between season one and season two, and it all being about who else is on the team. And he sounds a little like a little lonely, not having a Spanish speaker. I think Ryan Ginty, our producer, points him in the way of some of the local um, Argentinian hotspots in New York City. But this is a guy. This is a guy I think who could be very, very good for the Eagles. Um, we heard him. You know, he has to get maybe a little bit bigger. Um, and maybe maybe it's not bigger for me, but he needs to probably be a little bit more powerful. But he's got the build where he can put on some size um, and he can be a little bit more powerful. But he's just a really, really nice rugby player. They used him a lot as a lock last season and not really on the blind side, which for I, I think he would fit OK as a blind side for the most part. But I, I do agree with you. More powerful. Interestingly, he's <laughs> the fastest guy on that team. Like is that right? In the four in the forty meter and in the Bronco, he is the fastest guy on that team. So maybe Mike Friday wants to take a look at him. I know Gary Gold has um he's played uh in I think it was in the qualifying series against Uruguay and then against the All Blacks. So he's he's touching for selection. I know he went down for the, the high performance camp that they had, but a very 
young, uh, you know, Argentine American Eagle that I think will have a long career um, in a very stuffed back row. Um, Cause we have so many options at back row, but if you look at just the kind of player he is with how fast he can be, um, I, I think he gives you a very good attacking weapon at six. And if you pair him with um, a high work rate player like Andrew Guerra um, and then another um, attacking player like a Henko Hamishice, uh, then you've got really big time ball carriers in your back row that also has a little bit of balance um, as, as well. Um, that, that gives you to, to balance in the back row, but very interesting um, guy who I, I thought was, would be a great sort of feature of, of young and up and coming Eagles um, for the show. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting because, um, you know, Benji talked a little bit about what's next. And I think when you look at um, like, when you look at New York and Atlanta, right, what you see is, they they still have something to fight. They they have a battle to have, right? Because they're they're playing for that home field. Um, a Toronto in it, yeah. Toronto's in it, but it, it's going to be really really tough. They have to win both of their games. They've got to get probably maximum points. And I think eight um, like ATL doesn't win this weekend, right? I think that's what that's what the schedule says. So I think what's interesting for me, and one of the things that I want to do my deep dive in, is what is the what are the free jacks doing? Right, um, they're they're in the playoffs. They they don't re, you know they don't mathematically have a guaranteed spot um, number one seed where they can rest, but they do. Um, but I think they need like two losing points, right? They need two points in their last two games to be able to secure that. So so they probably have it. In the on the other side, what we're looking at is I mean it's really really interesting, right? You're looking at the Giltinis. Um, and the Gilgronis and the Houston Sabercats, probably the three that are coming in. The Sabercats, certainly a little bit at jeopardy, but they have it in their own hands. And so you're at this part of the season, Aaron, where how you manage your team is really important. So the only team that really is able to rotate is New England. And we saw that a little bit this past weekend, and they got blitzed, right? They got blitzed by Toronto. And so I think one of the really interesting things that, you need to do as a coach as you get into these playoffs is you need to manage your team, especially for New England, in a way that keeps your momentum going but allows you to rotate players because you want players to be fresh when they come into the playoffs. <clears throat> the one thing I would say about New England is that you can probably, because you're going to get that week off, you can play your best players in the next two weeks. But what they're obviously doing, and I think we saw this with Bowden Wacker, is they're saving players that might have a bit of an injury. And I'm wondering if you're like the Sabercats, you win this weekend, you get into that last game, you're like, the chances of us making the top one or two is probably pretty small. They're a very physical team. I think we might see Houston do some rotation. And depending on how the games go this weekend, the Giltinis might have that number one stop um, slot sealed up. The Gilgronis might have be pretty close to that number two. You might see them rotate as well. So I think player management over the next two weeks is going to be really important because it's a it's a you know it's not a long season but it's an intense season, and I think that intensity is really going to show up in the teams that can end up in the playoffs fresh. One of the things I've run into when I when I when I've met a lot of our our, our foreign players that have come in, they get very surprised at how physically intense th this league is and how, although, you know, we're still growing when it comes to skills, our players play very hard. And it, and I, th I'm not going to say it exacerbates injuries, but maybe like soft tissue injuries that some guys weren't necessarily expecting um, from this league, because I think at the end of the day, this is not as uh easy of a competition as some people think and the coaching is at a decent standard so guys are playing very well and playing very hard but one of the things that we've looked at on this show specifically and you've looked at over the past couple of years is because our rosters are pretty shallow um it's about who has the healthiest roster most of the season and basically that is the team who has won every single 
um, year in this league is who has the most consistent and healthiest roster. And the only team that I recall that was ever able to successfully rotate their roster almost week in and week out or even in game was, was last year's rugby ATL team. And they would, the way Scott Lawrence would use his team is he would platoon his entire team where they basically rotate the nines and tens out and key forwards and play them only 40 minutes to start. And, and then they would get to the point in the mid season where they would rotate the entire roster and still win games, but you haven't that, but they didn't win the championship either. Right. Um, right. Uh, but, but so a- ATL, uh, 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 the were last year, the most physical team, like if you're going to play that kind of defense, you have to have depth. Like, like you can't play that physical defense and expect everyone to play like 16 games in the season just isn't going to happen. And so part of that is really driven by your style of play. And that's why I think Houston may be the team that wants to do some rotation because they're such a physical team, not so much defensively, but definitely um, on, on offense. And actually New England in the forwards are also very direct on, on attack. Um, and so, you know, that, that's where your rotation really fits your philosophy and, and, and how you want to play. So let's, let's, let's get into the games this weekend. Um, and Dan is going to be very, very happy, Aaron, with you, because <laughs> there is Friday night footy and yeah. it is a big game. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Houston Sabercats at Seattle. It's at 1030 p.m. Um, <laughs> Eastern time. Aaron, who are you going to pick in this game? Are you allowed to pick as a as, as a league official? I don't. I mean, no, I'm not picking. I'm not really picking games. Um, I when I do right, pick cool. games, we'll I, just I, talk through it then. Okay, yeah. I the mean, biggest I mean, one I mean, you is pick it, you pick it on Super Brew, right? Yeah, it's it's a must win for Seattle. If they want in, they have to. I I think if Seattle wants to sec- fully secure, because we've done tons of scenarios for this. Um. They need to win the next two games with two bo- with a bonus point each, and the Sabercats can't get any bonus points the next two weeks. Right. So they need, so they have they to, need to win. Like the Sa- yeah, the Sabercats, because they're 10 points ahead. If the Sabercats get one point in the next two weeks, Seattle's eliminated. Yep. Yep. So- and is that true for San Diego as well? Because San Diego has a bye, right? So they're four points. Yeah, so, so guess, San Diego uh, yeah, needs to win their yeah. last game, and and thing ne- things need to get not go the SaberCats way, and right. then also uh, I think it would be uh, LA would have to win and no bonus points uh, for Seattle next week in the LA versus Seattle match to <laughs> for San Diego to get in um, to basically replace the SaberCats. It's a yeah, uh, it's it's it's. It's the Saber Cats, which is yeah, the Sab- yeah, the Saber Cats need in the, the last two games two points, and if they yep. get two points, they're in the playoffs. I mean, yeah. I would say that they like maybe, but I, I mean, this team, this this is a league, and this is a Saber Cat team that has started scoring points. So maybe against Seattle, but they're playing the Gilgronies next, right? And the Gilgronies might actually have already sealed something up by that point. It'll be yeah. interesting. I, I mean, I guess. You know, it's it's at home against Austin, and 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 it's away to Seattle. I mean, those are two tough teams. You could see them lose, like losing a game twenty one ten, right? You lose that game twenty one ten. It's close, but you don't get any points. Didn't score four tries. Didn't end up with seven. I mean, I guess I guess it could happen. This goes back to your first comment, Aaron. That this is a a a must win for Seattle, and because it's a must win for Seattle, I'm going to pick Seattle at home. Raucous crowd, Friday night lights. I'm gonna go. Right. I'm gonna go with Seattle. I'm not. I'm not gonna ask you, Aaron, because I know, <laughs> you know, as a league official, everyone can get a super brew and see your picks. But, but I don't want. I'm not I, doing I good. Don't want you to get in trouble. <laughs> I'm not doing good this season. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome to my world. Um, you, you're not doing good, but you're not doing as badly as I am. Um, this next game is also a must win. It is Toronto at ATL. Obviously. The Arrows know Atlanta really well, although different stadium this year. Um, I haven't looked at the weather, but I'm going to guess it's going to be hot and humid. Like, really hot and humid? That would be yeah. my guess. Extremely. 
Um, so, you know, arrows have come on, found some form. Uh, rugby ATL was skidding quite a lot. Uh, we didn't really, they were, you know, <laughs> they were locked in with New England for a tight race to, to the, the front at the beginning of the season and then in the middle they've just uh, had some attrition and and basically run into some teams that came on to some form um but I, they found their defense which at times this season they didn't have um and they found their attack which at times this season they didn't have and with that combination you've got um got a formidable team because they're very physical and when they do, when their attack is running, it clicks and they score a lot of points. Um, so right. I, they need, I think if they get two bonus points in here, like they don't necessarily need to win, but it it really, at the end of the day, Toronto has to win or it, it doesn't matter um, for Toronto. Well, look, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think Toronto has to win this game. Rugby ATL needs, I think four points. Um, if it's tied Aaron, it's goes to head to head, right? If, if you end up tied on points, yeah. it's whoever won the head to head. So it, it, yeah. So this game, um, has potentially, uh, more importance, right? Um, because if, if, if the arrows win, win this game, but it is an Atlanta, I think it's. I think. I think Toronto played well last week, um, uh, but I think ATL played better. And I think because it's at home in that heat, I think that's going to be really, really tough. I am going with the rugby ATL home team, um, and that game. Oh, I should do this. Is this is where Dan's Dan's very good. That is three p.m. Eastern on Saturday. Also on Saturday, a little bit later, eight p.m. Eastern is the San Diego Legion at the Gulbronies, and we've already talked about the Legion. This is their last game. They have to win it. And then they're going to be like, you know, if, if they win this game, maybe they're going to be like a golfer who's finished his 18 holes sitting, sitting at the uh, Masters waiting for someone to come down the 18th ferry to find out if they can beat their score. Um, this is going to be a really, really tough one. I actually think San Diego lost a couple of players, I think, last week. Um, and so I think the Gilgronies are going to pull this off. I think they're going to put the nail in San Diego season. Um, I think the Gilgronies are going to have too much at home. And I think that's going to be team. I think at the end of this weekend, Aaron, I think it's only um, Seattle. It'll be between the Seawolves and the Houston Sabercats to see who can take that third spot. I think everything else will be I mean, sealed. The, the, the Legion have found some form. Um, it took them most of the season to find some form. And the Gilgronies, after a high-flying start to their season, um, have struggled a bit, right? So when, when it comes to that, it's not to say, you know, who wants it more, everyone wants it. It's just going to be, at the end of the day, if the Legion don't win, they're completely out, right? And the Gilgronies, I think, are safe, but – Right now, they're knocked out of of the first seed. So, if they want the first seed, they need and so they can get that by. They need to win both these games with a bonus point to push LA back. And LA needs to, you know, not score some bonus points in the next two games. So it's a right. So yeah, it's it, it's a tough one. Um, and, and San Diego is going to be flying high off that win in, in New Orleans, which yeah, Jason Higgins. Um, you know, really didn't get to play a lot last year uh, for um, for Toronto and was supposed to play a couple of years ago for New York and now finds himself um, with the injury to Nate Augsburger playing a real lot for, for San Diego and playing really well. Like, good for Canada to have this kid um, playing down in the U.S. Um, and, and tearing it up. You know, I know they're not going to the World Cup, but they apparently have some summer tests that they're going to do. So, you know. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, those are, I mean, that's where you want to invest, right? For the, for the Canadians, it's it's not 2023, it's 2027. So, you know, you're not looking at late 20s, you're looking like mid to early 20s. And, and, and I think, I think they've, got a, they've got a good one there. Slightly out of order here, Aaron, in the, in the run sheet, we should definitely... Um, like going to, you should definitely go and talk to the producer stats boy and work out um, when he's doing this. Because four thirty on 
on Saturday is the um, Giltinis at Utah. Utah coming off a great win last weekend, but the Giltinis, number one seed, only one point ahead of the, the Gilgronis. Um, this is a really, really interesting one for me because it's not clear to me that the Giltinis have really solved their fly half issue. And Utah looked really good. Like the best they've looked trap all games. season, I think. Major yeah, trap you game. Think this is the trap game. Yeah, I, I mean, you if you look at the other what two, trap game is to the people who, who. So Utah are out, but they can do damage like they did this last week for, uh, against the Bill Gronies. Um, and they've found their form the past couple of weeks. So um, if things cannot go right for the Giltinis, um, Obviously, they they played pretty well against Dallas this last week, but uh, you know they. I think the Utah is the the block in which pe- teams will stumble upon the rest of the season. Um, I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm actually going with Utah here. I think the I think that the Giltinis are, are not the the juggernaut they were last year. I think that they've got issues at ten. I think Utah are found, finding some combinations. Right, Zane going looks like a really really good. Like nine, that's going to really provide um, a lot of play for uh, play play for Utah. So I think I think the I think Utah are going to win. Um, you know, finish the season playing well. Um, I think this will be close, but I think Utah Utah will pull it off to make to make. I think I'm, I'm selecting the Gold Grannies to jump back up to first place, but still a lot to play for in that last week. So now we're on to Sunday, and it's going to be two thirty p.m. Eastern. Rugby New York at Old Glory DC. Old Glory DC struggling a little bit the last week. They they had a little bit of form and now not doing so well. Um, Rugby New York obviously not had didn't have a good game. Big big game for them. I mean, Old Glory. What do you think? I think the conditions are right for. I guess another. I mean, the next. Two of these can be trap games for for everyone. I, I guess the last three we're talking about are all trap games. But um, if it's hot, conditions are in Old Glory's favor because they, for as for as tough of a game as they played, they they found their form to score points. There was a defense optional game against Houston. Yep. Um, but the thing that that hurts them is uh, Abi Nakitini had a red card and um, has been suspended for three weeks, um, which. Um, so he's out, uh, obviously some other players are out and they have to deal with some injuries, but, um, they found a way to score last week and they score a lot. Uh, and New York struggled, um, to, to find their attack. Uh, last week, I think if, if you get Andy Ellis in the lineup, it probably helps them out a lot. Um, but, uh, if New York wants to be safe um, in in where they they fit in the the playoff standings for the East, I, they they need to they need to win this game so that they're the second and they host uh, so that they can host the eliminator for the East. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the game. I think Nate Brakley will return this week. I think that that was a big loss last week for New York. Like you and I both know how much I love Nate. Like he, you know, his 50 ruck entries are just ridiculous. Like yeah. off, congratulations off to Nate so Brakley on back. getting, congratulations to Nate Brakley oh, on his marriage. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 It's a, so, you know, a good reason not to be in a rugby game, but like, I mean, come on, who, who's, I mean, I'm not going to judge because COVID makes it really difficult. So we'll just say congratulations. And now there's a chance to make up for it. Um, this week. So I'm actually going to go, I love Old Glory. Um, I, I think they've done a lot, but I think they've always struggled with depth. That's been the thing that's really hurt them this year. And so I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Rugby New York. So we have um, the last game on Sunday. It's the game on Fox Sports 1. It's at 6.30 p.m. It is Nola Gold at New England Free Jacks. I mean, you said it's a trap game. I don't know. I mean, I don't know about this. If New England was still on their winning streak, maybe. But New England pretty much well, got, they, well, they were well it, eaten for, last week. For me, if New England was on their winning streak, I wouldn't consider this a trap game. But because of their performance um, against Toronto, I think it's sort of a trap game. However, if Bodie Walker is back, um, th- then you'd be 
you'd be pretty fair to probably pick them 15 over. But if if the roster, not to say that the roster was bad, like Harrison Boyle is a pretty good 10, but he hasn't played a lot of 10 for them this season. He's played mostly fullback, so he didn't have that connection um, with John Poland uh, like he did a, a bit last season early on. So if you get – if it's a full-strength uh, Free Jacks roster, this is going to be a test run to to get their playoff kinks and game plan set before they end up with uh, a first round buy. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that they, they have a first round buy. I think they want to finish well after that loss. I think they're going to come out firing. I think that I like, I think Waka plays if he's fit. I mean, I mean a hundred percent fit. I don't think you have to risk him, but I think everyone else is going to step up. Conradi's getting back into the swing of things. He had a good game last week. They have a really, really good back row. Um, Nola Gold have a pretty good back row too but I think physically New England are going to win this game I actually don't think it's going to be that close I think Nola Gold are kind of like you know potentially already thinking about you know doing having some fun on the last night of the season before before they all head home so I uh, you know and, and, and Aaron I think one of the really interesting things is that every game this weekend has a playoff implication yeah, so every game I, I, I has a team the, that that has the potential to be to have an impact in the playoffs. Th- that's the crazy thing about this league, and and I would say I used to hate the idea of a points based system, but if we look at the points based system and how it applies to Major League Rugby, well, we basically have never known the playoff teams until the final round of the of the season was right. over, and I think a because parity. But B, because of, you know, awarding table points and bonus points, it changes sort of the dynamic uh, of, a, of a league, even though in a traditional sport like rugby is, um, other than the NHL, um, you know, most points don't really matter that much because they don't have bonus point systems in the NBA right. and in the NFL or the MLB. Now, in the MLS, they do, but if you look at how close or not close rather those win loss records are in the MLS, um, when you have much closer win loss records, it really changes the dynamic of league play. When you have a, when you have more teams getting into the playoffs, like we do this year. Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's great for the league. Um, it's great for rugby uh, in America as we start building for 2031 um, and 2033, the two World Cups that we'll be hosting here. So um, I'm, we will call that a night. So I want a um, big thank you to um, Aaron Castro, Stats Boy, for stepping at the last, meet, um, last minute. Even bigger thank you to Ryan Ginty, who um, pulled himself off, off another project to be able to fit this in. And um, Dan, you weren't missed. So, um, but please come back because this hosting is really, really hard. So for myself, Pete Steinberg, for um, Aaron Castro and for Ryan Ginty and not for Dan Power, thanks for joining us and thank you for listening to and watching MLR Kickoff.